Hi, my name is Sage Foley and I'm a stitcher, stylist, and designer that works in film, fashion, and theater. So my body isn't shaped like a standard dress form, in fact, most people's bodies aren't. Of course you can take the key measurements, bust, hip, and waist, and compare it to your own and try and get a dress form that's as close as possible, but will that dress form be exact to your proportions? Probably not. Of course, I do fittings on myself and I like to work out most fit issues on my actual body, but I like to put my work on a dress form so I can take a step back and I can get a look at the overall picture. I found that slightly difficult on standard dress forms because especially places like the shoulders, the bust, things like that, just length proportions, the curves, the shapes, they weren't the same. So you can't work out those small fit issues on a standard dress form unless you pad it out, which is definitely an option. So to work around that, I decided to take on the big challenge of making myself a custom dress form. Besides kind of fit and proportions, my biggest goal for this project is to make it look as professional as possible. I want it to be fully pinnable, I want it to be durable, and I want it to have an actual dress form base with wheels and an actual dress form top. So when I started kind of thinking about this process of how I was going to go about this, the actual dress forms that I already own became my kind of most important reference material for this project. I took the base off of one, I saw how they put it together, I took the top off of one and saw that it was made of foam and had a batting cover and then it finally it was covered on the outer layer by the final fabric. So just looking at the actual dress forms themselves was a really valuable kind of fact-finding mission. Next I took to the internet and I actually saw if I could find a how it's made on dress forms and I did and that was super super helpful so I knew that I wanted to make a cast of my body and then I wanted to fill that cast with expanding foam surprisingly because I make YouTube videos I actually don't really watch that many YouTube videos unless I'm kind of researching for a project I want to do like this one so I took to YouTube to see if I could find if anybody else had made themselves a dress form kind of in the similar way that I wanted to make one and I found a video by the youtuber Morgan Donner and I was like, yeah, that looks really good. Um, and so I decided to use parts of her process up to kind of demolding the foam. We use a lot of the same products and a lot of the same process. After that, our kind of techniques diverge, but up until that point, it's basically the same. And watching her video actually allowed me to take a lot of the guesswork out of this process for me. But I have linked her video down below in case you want to check that out. Also in the description you can see the list of all of the materials that I used including links to where you can get them yourself. So first we have to start by making the actual cast of my body. We got a box of medical plaster bandages and we cut them into small lengths to make them more manageable. I put a thin layer of saran wrap over my clothes which kept them cleaner and kept them from getting wet. And then we tried to lather my skin in Vaseline. Really this step you can't put too much Vaseline on. The plaster will stick to your skin and hair and it's going to hurt when you take the mold off because I put a lot of Vaseline on and still it felt like pulling off a very strong bandage when I was done. <laughs> then my lovely assistant dipped the plaster strips in water and started putting them on me. You definitely will need help. There really isn't any way to do this yourself, especially when you go to do the back. It's just really not possible. Also, you want to move as little as possible. You want to stand up straight, you don't want to move your head, you want to keep everything as straight as possible or else you'll have to compensate for that later on in the process, which just adds on time to the project. This was also really cold. I currently am working in Colorado and we did this in the middle of January. We tried to use a propane heater in the garage, but it was still way too cold. The cleanup after this step actually isn't that bad. The plaster drippings are actually pretty easy to clean up. They even came off my shoes and clothing, so I would actually recommend putting down a drop cloth and just doing this inside of your house if it's too cold out. It can be a little messy, but it's also definitely cleanable. So my recommendation is just to save yourself a little discomfort and to just make sure that you feel comfortable in whatever temperature and environment you're in. Once we did the front half and let it dry, we put Vaseline on the outside edges of the body cast. We are making a two-part cast, so when we do the back, we don't want the overlap to stick to the front. Ideally, once both halves are dry, they will just pull right off. 
I tried to keep the cast on as long as possible so that the two halves could set to my form. When the plaster dries, it will kind of expand and kind of warp shape. So keeping it on the body longer will help it hold its shape. You want to keep it on as long as possible while it dries. After the two halves were dry enough, we made register marks on the front and back. This step was super helpful because once the cast is off, it will warp and settle as it dries. Having these register marks will help it stay as close to my proportions as possible when we need to put the two halves back together. We let the two halves sit overnight to make sure that they really dried. To prevent any parts from collapsing in on themselves, we stuffed towels underneath it and we also put boxes up against the edges to hold them up. We then poured plaster pairs into the forms to help smooth out any imperfections on the inside of the cast. This will also help with the demolding process as there will be less cracks and crevices for the foam to get stuck in. After the plaster pairs have dried overnight, we sealed the plaster with paste wax. This has a very strong smell and I would definitely do this outside. We also let this sit overnight. This project ended up taking a lot longer than I initially expected. I was hoping I could do it in a week. It took us a month. <laughs> And really the main reason for that is because between each step we had to let everything properly dry. If you take out any kind of hiccups we had, really I think it would only take about a week to do this project. Um, I think if I were to do it again in the future it would take me a lot less time. We put the front and the back together and then used the twine to secure them. And then with a triple layer of plaster bandages we sealed up the sides and shoulders. We then capped the neck and armholes. We did leave pore spots in the armholes to make sure it completely filled. Then it was time to finally pour the foam. Before we poured it in, we used a paintbrush to put in a mold release. I would not recommend this mold release. I would find something else. This just did not work, which you will see later when you see us be molding this. The cast was ruined. I went into this really only expecting to use the mold once, but I was not expecting it to be as hard to demold as it was. And I think it was because this mold release just didn't work. So don't get this mold release. Get a different one. It was really fun to watch the foam expand though, and it was really funny to watch all of the foam come out of the arm spouts. <laughs> really, it goes so much further than you think it's going to. It expands so much, which is really cool. We then started demolding the foam from the plaster. The mold release we used hardly helped. As I said, it was super difficult to demold the foam and it took us a really long time. Also, as I said before, the cast got completely ruined. When it comes to pouring the foam, we made one huge mistake, and that was pouring it at the wrong temperature. We decided to do it outside in case there were fumes, and it was way too cold outside for this. It was 40 degrees out, and the foam was supposed to be poured in at least 70 degrees. This caused the foam to not get as rigid as I would have liked. After I demolded it, when I pushed the foam in with my finger, it would leave an indentation. This really concerned me because professional dress storms are very rigid. This foam was pinnable, but it was too soft, and I was worried that over time, it would get dinged up and misshaped because it wasn't rigid enough. There were a couple hours where I thought we were going to start completely over just because I was so disappointed with the rigidity of the foam, but we had put so much time and materials already into the process and we really didn't want all of that to go to waste. So it was kind of a last ditch effort. I called my local Smooth On store and I asked them if I could bring in the project I was struggling with and asked them a couple questions and they were really really nice about it so i went in i got some advice and they actually ended up recommending Eurocoat, which is a rubber coating that usually goes over foam to smooth it out and to give it some more durability which sounded perfect also incredibly it's semi-permeable i told them that one of my biggest concerns was that whatever i covered it with still needed to be pinnable because i need the dress form to be fully pinnable and so they recommended this product and so we decided to take a chance on it and move forward with it and also it didn't hurt that it was actually pretty inexpensive. While I was at the store I actually did test out their foams with my pin so that I could recommend you guys a density foam that I think would actually be perfect for this. As I touched their two pound sample it was the same thing. Even though ours was mispoured and I think made ours a little bit softer, theirs was still, I think, a little bit too soft. And when you push the pin in, it's not like the foam gives away, it still resists the pin, but it doesn't quite feel the same as pinning a standard dress form. Now, the four pound foam, that was 
perfect. It's nice and rigid and it's just the right amount of pressure I think like kind of like give back on the pin when you pin it in. So if I were to do it again I would definitely use a four pound density foam instead of a two pound density foam. If you want to try this project you can use the two pound foam. I do have it linked below but I think overall a four pound foam would be much more durable and much more rigid and I think it's just going to work a lot better in the long run. Now, thankfully that I knew this foam form was salvageable, I had to move on to the step that I was most nervous about, the sanding step. I was nervous because at this point I had to fine tune the measurements of the form and make sure I kept it as close to my proportions as possible. I pinned some tool tape onto my shirt so that I could get some height and width measurements to use as reference as I sanded the form. The form was bigger than me by quite a bit from the plaster and then the foam expanding. So I sounded it down and I actually ended up sanding the whole thing an inch smaller than my measurements overall. I did this because I knew that the rubber, batting, and fabric cover would all add bulk and I didn't want the final product to be larger than me. This was a bit of a risk as I really didn't know how much bulk would be added by the next steps. Did I sand too much or not enough? At this point, I wouldn't really know until the whole project was finished, which is definitely a little intimidating. At this point, I separated out the bust to make it look more like a human <laughs> and less like a mannequin. I used one of my standard dress forms for reference in this. I also shaved down the neck so that the topper would fit around the top of the form. Now we started coating the whole thing in Eurocoat. Again, this step isn't necessary if you go with a more rigid foam or if you just decide that you don't mind the rigidity of the two pound foam. It requires a scale to measure out, but it was a pretty simple ratio. The one thing that was difficult is that we decided to fill any voids that we had with the rubber, which was hard as it's quite runny. Once we had a nice uniform layer, which took a couple of weeks to do, this was probably the most time consuming part as it was a lot of waiting for the coats to dry. We used a sander to smooth everything everything out as best we could. Now my lovely assistant, who is a carpenter, <laughs> took over to help engineer the wood base that will attach the form to the flange. He traced the shape of the bottom of the form onto three quarter inch plywood and then used this fancy pencil trick to mark out a quarter inch border on the bottom of the plywood. He then used a miter to cut this space out, leaving the border. The inside shape was then traced onto a quarter inch piece of plywood which is going to cover the fabric after it is stretched over the base piece of wood. Out of the quarter inch piece of plywood, he cut out a circle for the flange so that it will all sit flush with the bottom. Using some industrial glue and a nut in the size of the screw, attached the ball topper. My lovely assistant then pushed it into a hole we had made in the neck of the form. This worked great as it allows me to unscrew the ball and take the top on and off the form as needed. I then knew I needed to cut my arms off. I wanted to have a good reference point for my shoulder length and arm side measurement, but I also needed to be able to have access to the sides at my bust level. So as evenly as possible, I cut diagonals right to that arm crease. Then we glued and nailed the wood base to the bottom of the form. Using the leftover rubber, we filled the voids between the foam and the wood, which also served to really permanently affix the two pieces together. Those babies are not coming apart anytime soon. At this point, as you can see in this straight on view, I think I was standing with my weight slightly on one foot as we were making the form as the left shoulder is a little lower than the right and the right hip is a little lower than the left. Now of course, people aren't symmetrical and that is totally normal. However, I do know that my shoulders and hips aren't this asymmetrical unless I'm not standing straight. So using some batting, I decided to pad out these places to make the sides a little bit more even with one another. This is why it's so, so, so important to hold still and stand as straight as you can while you're making the cast. I sewed the layers together with a pad stitch while they were on the form so that they would retain the shape. Then I started making the batting cover. I wasn't initially planning on doing this, but it really helped to smooth out the imperfections and really did didn't add a lot of bulk. As I have gone along in the process, I have kept track of the key measurements to see if or how they have changed. But really after the rubber layer, the batting and outer fabric layers didn't actually add a ton of bulk. And if they did, it was a pretty negligible amount that I'm really not worried about when it comes to like draping or fitting on a form. I then stitched my batting layer together and used a clapper to flatten out my seams. I also cut my seam allowance with pinking shears which is going to prevent the harsh line of the seam allowance from showing on the outside of the cover. 
I also top stitched the seam allowance down to keep it from moving around when I put it on the form. I decided to close up the batting layer at the center back because I knew I would be closing up the final fabric layer at the side seams and I thought doing the same to the batting layer would cause too much bulk. Now you can see the form with its batting cover side by side with one of my professional dress forms. I used thin black tape to draw out the seam lines using the professional form as reference. Stretching muslin over the different sections, I created all of the 22 pattern pieces needed to make the cover for the form. I washed my final cover fabric to pre-shrink it, although in hindsight, I wish I wouldn't have shrunk it until it was on the form, which could have gotten rid of some of the bias wrinkling in the end. In the How It's Made video, they did use a sponge to actually shrink the fabric when it was already on the form, and I think that might be why professional dress forms are so smooth and don't have a lot of kind of bias wrinkling. I then cut out the pieces onto my final fabric and started assembling the cover. Once the front and the back were separately assembled, I sewed them together from the top of the neck to the end of the shoulder, leaving the rest open. The lower part of the side seam will all be hand sewn. Before I hand sew the sides though, I put a piece of plastic under my outer layer so that I could use black fabric paint to paint my name on the form and the place where the size number usually is on standard forms. I just thought this was a really cute idea and I just wanted to make it, again, like I said, as professional looking as possible. So I thought putting something there would make it look like it was made in a dress form factory. <laughs> I then took the black tape and all of the pins out of the form and started putting the final cover on. This takes a lot of give and take as you want to keep lines as centered and straight as possible while still forming it to the body. There was a lot of pinning, repinning, repinning again. It was all, it was a process. Then I began to whip stitch up the side seams. This really does tighten everything and give it a really nice fit. I then used my hands to kind of stretch the fabric down around the base and used the staple gun to staple it to the wood. Next, we screwed the flange onto the base and nailed the finishing piece of plywood over the fabric. And with that, it's done. Now let's compare my form to myself and to a standard form. As previously mentioned, you can see some wrinkling in the final cover fabric especially when compared to the professional forms. Of course, while I would have preferred it to be perfectly smooth, the companies that make these forms have years of experience on how to perfectly cut the pattern pieces for all of the sizes that they make, and then how to sew them together to have no wrinkling at all. I think considering the fact that this is my first time ever making a dress form, I did a pretty good job. So here is my form compared to my size six standard form, which has about the same bust, waist, and hip measurements as the form that I made and as myself. From the front, the most obvious difference is the height. If I make the bottoms level, you can see that the hips and the waist are much higher on the one that I made. However, if I level out the bust points, you can see that from the bust up, they are about the same height. What this means is that I just have extremely high hips, which is something that I discussed in my pants sloper video, and is why I have a hard time binding pants for myself that are high-waisted enough. When the two forms are turned to the side, you can really see the difference between the two. You can see the curve of my back when compared to the standard form. The standard form Form doesn't really account for any shoulder slouch either. Even though I was standing straight when I took the cast, I obviously have a little bit more volume around my shoulders, which is probably from being hunched over a sewing machine for hours. I just think that generally, the form that I made represents much more natural slopes and curves than a standard dress form does. Now we can compare the form to my own body. I think it's very close, especially from the side view. From the front, you can see the similarity, I do think that the form I made ended up being a little shorter waisted than me by maybe about half an inch to an inch, which is probably due to either me moving when we did the casting or due to the materials expanding as they dried. Who knows, but I don't think this is the end of the world. I think that as far as the side view goes, the proportions are really spot on. Just for comparison's sake, here is me compared to the standard form. Again, I have the same cruise circumference measurements as this form, but my volume is just distributed in different ways. This form is about an inch longer waisted than I actually am, so I think really when it comes to waist to bust to hip ratio, height, all of that stuff, I actually land somewhere between this form and the one I made. I'm shorter waisted than the standard dress form, but a little longer waisted than the dress form I made. 
Overall, I'm really proud of this dress form, and I really think between this one and my standard form, I am completely covered when it comes to all of my draping and fitting needs. Of course, dress forms can't bend and squish the way human bodies can, so no matter what dress form I drape on, I will always do fittings and adjustments on my actual body. But I do think that this form is going to be a really valuable tool to have in my sewing studio moving forward. I hope you all enjoyed the video, and if you end up making your own dress form with this process, please send me pictures. I really want to see it. Honestly, I make a lot of things. I sew things for my job, but for some reason I am more proud of this project than just about anything I've ever sewn. And I think it was because I had to be put out of my comfort zone to do it. It felt like it was a very high risk, high reward type of project. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And if you want to see more from me in the meantime, you can follow me on Instagram at fully dressed, but I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a good day. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.